All right, good afternoon and welcome to this joint hearing of the House Environment and Energy Committee and the House Transportation Committee on this first day of the new session. It's great to see everyone. Um, and I just wanna give a shout out to our uh, staff for having made this logistical leap on the very first day of session. Uh, and sorry for the delay, but here we are in a different location. Uh, so we're, we are going to come together and hear from our state climatologist to kick off the um, afternoon's testimony. And the overall heading is uh, post kind of the flooding, but also understanding climate change in Vermont, putting it into context and understanding our respective agencies response, it, both to the floods, but also to climate change more broadly. So with that. Um, I just wanna add, I think Chair Sheldon and I thought this would be a really great opportunity for our committees to be in the same space together, to learn from each other, because I think we have different perspectives on some of these issues. And so I just know I'm really looking forward to the afternoon and to returning again on Friday to do this work. So thanks everybody for doing a kind of more complicated first day back, but nobody's new anymore so we thought you would all be up for it so thanks in advance all right and with that um, i'd love to introduce dr leslie ann duplini giro i hope i got that close enough um, our state climatologist uh, who's joining us via zoom um, as our fir first witness welcome thank you chair sheldon and happy new year 2024 to everybody um thank you for the invitation to be here um, let me try and, and get all set it here. I have a screen sharing, but it says it's disabled right now. Well, you're going to make her a co-host. Okay. This is the same guy that was downstairs at the door. Great. Yes, we can see your screen now. Okay, perfect. And I can still see you in the corner here. All right, so thank you again to, to both committees for the invitation to come on the very first day of our legislative session and talk a little bit about weather, climate, and climate change for the state of Vermont. And what I'm going to try to do is to do a sort of big picture piece, but also tie it into a lot of the events that we saw last year in 2023, so that we're all on the same page with why these events are occurring, why the frequencies, the durations are occurring, and then um, end a little bit up with some of the things that we can do um, in this particular space here, in this particular session. So for day, today, what we're gonna look at are some of the hazards that we've been experiencing, flooding, droughts, and so on, but also putting it in the context of, of climate change and looking at it through the lenses of who is vulnerable, who needs to be part of that conversation, what are some of the, the sectors of our economy as a state that we need to have front and center, and then what is it about our landscape that, that makes us more vulnerable in certain parts versus others. So those are some of the, the, the themes that are going to be running through as we step through and, and chat today. So just to make sure that we are looking at all sectors, um, who is vulnerable to weather, climate, and climate change? Well, some of the sectors that are um, particularly at risk, that are particularly exposed, include our various elements of our infrastructure. So that includes our roads, but also includes our electrical grid. It includes our critical facilities. It includes um, various aspects of emergency management from the state level all the way down to the town and the municipal level. Um, it affects us as human beings, so various aspects of, of our human health are also um, at risk. And then um, parts of our economy in, in terms of our forestry sectors, in terms of our agricultural sectors, tourism and recreation are also things that we're looking at in looking at, at the vulnerability to our changing climate. So when we talk about hazards, what are some of the hazards that are uh, particularly observed across the state? And you, you'll notice right off the bat that the ones that we think about first are, are flooding, for example, and then the flip side of the coin, droughts. But we can't forget about um, winter storms, whether it's snowstorms, whether it's ice storms. We, we can't forget about those very, very heavy rainfall um, occurrences that occur during the, the summertime. Um, wildfires have been with us 
for decades. They were particularly bad in 2023, so we'll talk about that. Um, they had elements of, of air pollution that affect us as human beings, but are also part of the challenges for the landscape. And then when we think about temperature, we have very cold conditions, which are becoming less frequent, but they're still there. And the flip side of that are very hot days, which are also important for us for a number of different um, reasons. Winds are something that we don't always think about. And when we're talking about winds, we're looking at whether they are very concentrated winds, whether they're very uh, fast. We, we hear about wind gusts. Sometimes there's fast as hurricane force wind gusts. And so uh, bringing wind and moving air into the equation. And then because we're such a, a mountainous state, we, we can see winds that tend to occur on one side of our mountains, uh, very fast flowing winds, and, and we call those shirkshas. So these are an, another piece of what we're looking at um, in here. And then the I think last we all just learned a word. Excuse me. Oh, did you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there's gonna be a quiz at the end of this. Make sure you spell okay. it right. We're in school. There we go. <laughs> so, so the last part in, in here are as, as the temperatures warm and the, the ecosystems and natural habitats change, um, we have more um, increases in, in terms of, of the insects that are invasive species or that are, are populations are booming, for example, and other types of disease. So we've got the, the biotic or the, the biological <clears throat> pieces of what we're at risk for. So these are, um, some that I've, I've sort of gone through over the years and compiled into this list so that we have it all in, in one place. So as you're looking at this um, and you're thinking about how much um, damage, economic damage occurs as a result of any one of those hazards, this graph that you're seeing here um, shows you the billion dollar disasters across the entire United States starting in 1980 and going up until last year. And each one of these colors represents a certain type of hazard that caused at least a billion dollars worth of disaster. So you, you see things like the wildfires, you see the winter storms and so on. And a couple of things that you're noticing right off the bat is that the number of these hazards and disasters has been increasing, but also the price tag has also been increasing. So you're seeing um, more and more costly hazards. So across this is across the entire US. The other thing that you're seeing here that might surprise you is you see these green bars. Those green bars are the, the ones that are the, the highest type of hazard contributing to these billion dollar disasters. And you may be surprised that it's not hurricanes or tropical cyclones. It's actually those severe storms. So the, the summertime convective type storms are actually the ones that produce most of the billion dollar disasters across the entire US. So that's that's another piece that we're sort of thinking about here as we put all of this into, into context. So that begs the question, why is Vermont so hazard prone? And are there places across the state that are more hazard prone than others? And then what can we sort of do about this? So the big answer in terms of why we're so hazard prone is our, our physical geography. And what this upper diagram here shows us is the, the green mountains, the spine of the greens that we see here are a continuation of the Appalachian mountains, which also continue into the white mountains in um, New Hampshire as well. So this, this very steep topography is a large reason why we have so much um, hazard proneness in, in, an, in another word. And so it sets up conditions for um, very heavy rainfall because as, as mm -hmm. air rises, it um, produces more rainfall than if the land was just flat like this. And having these mountains also sets up conditions where sometimes you get um, snowfall on one side of that Appalachian Green Mountain, White Mountains, you get um, snowfall on one side and you might get icing on the other side. So knowing that our topography is critically important allows us to understand why we're so much <clears throat> at risk. So if we think back to 10th of July last year, 2023, 
uh, topography piece comes back in in here. So this this is a um, a satellite shot showing you all of those storm systems that you know span 9th, 10th, and 11th of July 2023. And as you're looking at it in here, you're seeing that a lot of those um, central parts of the state there was there was a sort of concentration of all of those storm systems. So lots of rain concentrated and pouring out in the central part of the state itself. And you're seeing a lot of moisture coming in from the Atlantic, which helped to fuel all of those storms. Um, you had some other storm systems or low pressures coming in towards us from the West and all of those sort of meeting over us here. And then the last thing I wanted to point out to you as this loop plays, what you'll see is if you look really closely, you'll see the effect of wildfires coming in. See that, mm. everybody see that? Right, yeah. so there's some wildfires, the smoke, the smoke hadn't gone away, even though we're in the middle of all of those flooding conditions. So as, as we're thinking about this as part of the reason why I'm putting all of these hazards on the table, because we can have multiple hazards and multiple risk going on at the same time. So that was last year. If we go back 12 years to Irene, which is one of our markers, Again, we're seeing the, the influence of a, a tropical system moving um, northward across the state, going over some very, very complex terrain, very, very complex um, mountain systems, the taconics down in the southern part of the state, and giving us a tremendous amount of damage, um, including some of the infrastructure damage that we've seen, unfortunate loss of businesses, unfortunate loss of um, agricultural produce because whenever floodwaters touch crops, they have to be destroyed, disposed of because they, the floodwaters um, can contain contaminants. And so we don't want that to be consumed by us as human beings. Um, loss of, of village centers, loss of, of individual properties. Those are some of the, the, um, the very, very sad um, images that we saw post Irene. And again, um, bridges, other sorts of infrastructure also being destroyed. Uh, if we keep going back in time, what you're seeing here is a map that was created by Jonathan Croft of VTrans that showed all of the roads that were closed at one point in time um, during or just after Irene. And those are these colors. Can everybody see the colors okay? <clears throat> so you're seeing some yellows and some greens and some reds. Those are road closures. And what he did was he superimposed your Irene closures on top of the, the damages from the 1927 flood and they, they match up perfectly, right? Because the roads have not moved since the 1927 flood. And so in Irene, and again, in, in last year's flood, you're seeing that perfect match of where there tends to be this proneness to having um, our, our road infrastructure being damaged. So here's a blow up of the central part of our, of our state. And again, you're seeing the Irene floods in here. Those are those colors. And the, the black lines are the 1927 floods in here. Okay, so this, this is a, I like this because what it allows us to do is to see exactly where possibly in the future you'll have yet another set of damage because of, of that um, the relationship between your roads and your, and your rivers particularly where they've been affected in the past. So one way of saying that is, is that they're next to each other. Sometimes they're a couple of feet away. And that's what we're seeing across in here. There's some places where um, your roads and your rivers are so close that that repeat flooding tends to occur. So one, one route is Route 100. Another place is, is, is the Jay Peak region where we see a lot of that sort of coming together, um, sort of Montgomery, um, region of the state, just um, south of Jay Peak across in here. And on the left-hand side, you're seeing that same sort of relationship in the Waterbury area where you've got I-89, which is this blue line here, and we've got uh, the Winooski River and the, the way in which all of these sort of come together and get pinched off if the Winooski overflows its banks, which is what happened um, during Irene itself. So we're, we're looking to see where those pinpoints, pinch points, literally, are across in this region in here. So <laughs> topography is important for roads, topography is important for floods, but it's also important for air quality. And, and that's because um, when you have 
uh, mountains and, and valleys, if you have a lot of um, pollutants in the atmosphere, if you have a lot of smoke, whether it's wildfire smoke, whether it's other type of burning, and it tends to collect in the valleys, what that sets up is, is very poor air quality conditions and has the potential to, to sort of trigger a lot of human health um, implications as a result. So air quality is directly related to um, where our mountains and our, our valleys also occur. So this is a shot, another satellite shot from exactly a week after the historic floods on the 10th of July, 2023. And, and you're seeing again, the, the very extensive nature of all of those um, wildfire plumes and smoke that made their way down, not, not just across Vermont and New Hampshire, Massachusetts, but all the way down to uh, New York and DC and so on. So we're looking at that relationship in here. The, the other piece that's important that we've also seen in terms of air quality is there are times when there is a lot of pollution in the air that triggers an air quality alert that says, okay, if you have a, a respiratory ailment, um, please stay inside. Or if you um, are exercising, try to do so either early in the day or late in the day. So um, that, of course, is related to, to smog. And as we're looking at it, we saw that um, really, really clearly during the COVID pandemic. When, if you remember, we went into a lockdown, and so um, industrial production ceased. Um, we were driving, and so we, we, what we saw was this dramatic decrease in smog conditions because the um, the, the materials that got used to, to create the smog were actually less. And so this this is a sort of average of what um, traditional or typical conditions look like across most of the Northeast. And this is what it looks like. It looked like during the pandemic when everything shut down. So the, the gas that we're looking at here from an air quality perspective is ozone. And <clears throat> ozone is being monitored in a couple places across the state. It's being monitored in the North, which are these green lines here. And it's also being monitored in the South, which are these blue lines here. And you see that the amount of ozone, you know, the amount that sort of triggers your smog alerts tends to be higher in the southern part of the state than it is in the northern part of the state. So um, having these measurements allows us to, to sort of understand where across our geography um, is particularly at risk. Now, smog is one piece that we're looking at, but then if we expand this a little bit, to what else can we talk about human health wise we can see some things in here. So folks always used to ask me, well, what about Lyme disease? And I was never able to have a really, really good answer until we finally had this, um, this product that came out um, that talks about where the Lyme disease cases were being reported. And so as, as you look at this, you see this dramatic amount of increase in Lyme disease cases being reported across the Northeast, including Vermont, so you see this, 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 this massive explosion of cases um, in, in 2018 versus 1996 as one of those things that we're looking at from a human health perspective. Now, the other thing that we're also gonna be looking at is, is high temperatures. And so whenever we hear those alerts, it's gonna be a hot day, it's gonna be a heat wave, please stay inside. Um, what we're looking at is temperatures that are more conducive to us here in the Northeast, 87 degrees Fahrenheit, because as, as Northeasterners, as Vermonters, we are not as acclimated to the higher temperatures in 90 degrees and 95 degrees that you tend to see in the Southern states. So when you hear a heat alert um, going out, it's 87 degrees. And this was some work that was done by um, one of my postdocs, Dr. Evan Oswald, in conjunction with the Vermont <clears throat> Department of Health um, about 10 years ago. So let's, let's talk about temperatures a little bit more. And we're doing it both from a high temperature as well as a cold temperature because they're both equally important. So exactly one year ago, January of 2023, that January was actually the warmest January 
since we started keeping records in 1895. Yeah. And so as, as we're seeing this here, um, that's another clear indication of how our, um, our planet continues to warm because we're seeing our wintertime temperatures exceeding values that they've never exceeded before. So January 2023 was the warmest January um, since 1895. So if you're wondering, how can we bring this a little bit closer to home? So there's a product called the Climate Explorer, the Climate Resilience Toolkit, that allows us to actually experiment with and, and, and um, explore what climate change looks like on a zip code level. So I, was, I, I believe everybody has a copy of, of these slides in here. Mm -hmm. So you might wanna put a little star next to this one and Google, when you put it in, go and put your own zip code in here because what it will allow you to do is it'll allow you to see how temperatures or precipitation or whatever else has changed over time since 1950. But more importantly, it will show you how there's going to be projected to change in the future. So as you're looking at this, the projections are these red lines and the blue lines. And the red line is projections of, in this case here, high temperatures for the day under high emissions. And then if we try to reduce emissions, what the temperatures would be in the low emissions scenario, which is this blue line across in here. So try this out, put it in your zip code. You're able to do this for everywhere across, not just the state, but also the entire nation as well. So that's, that's, that's temperature, usually on the high end. Let's think about what happens on low end. And one of the things that we've noticed is we're, we're seeing temperatures, particularly in the, the springtime that are uh, what we call a backward spring or backward season, where the temperatures actually look like they're increasing and then they drop in April or May. Yeah. And when they drop, you know, then you're also seeing things like snow falling in April, snow falling in May. Um, you see things like killing frosts. So the plants that had started to bud are actually nipped in the bud, um, literally. Um, because of these frosts. And we saw that again last year in 2023. And a lot of times when that happens, right after that, we tend to see drought conditions, which again is what we saw last year in 2023. So from an agricultural perspective, we're, we're seeing this sort of like frost followed by drought, which is what we saw last year and the year before. And that has implications for the viability of our agriculture sector. So that's one piece that I'm, I'm sort of bringing into the equation here as we think about it from an all sector perspective here. So let's leave temperature and let's talk a little bit about moisture conditions. So the two extremes again, too much moisture, too little moisture, and then what does this mean for us? So one of the things that we are seeing with moisture which is this lower diagram here. Mm -hmm. As our, our, our climate continues to change, one of the things that we're seeing is that there, there are more heavy precipitation events. So more either rainfall falling, more snowfall falling, and there are fewer events where there's light drizzle or light precipitation, right? And so this is, this is one of the, the observations that we're making here from a, a moisture perspective. So when it plays out, um, what, what you're seeing, I purposely did not pick the 2023 because I wanted us to see that it's not just last year, but it's also um, a number of years that we're seeing this pattern sort of playing out. And as you're looking at this across in here, again, you're seeing right, right off the bat, the influence of your topography. So the highest values occurring in the highest parts of the state. And of course, this, this large value here is, is Mount Washington. So we're looking at this, these large events where you're getting two, three, four, five inches of precipitation, either in a single day or in two or three days. So these multi-day events are also important here. So rainfall is only one aspect of what falls from the sky. We can also look at snowfall. And when we look at snowfall, there's, there's a, a really good um, scale that allows us to kind of, of compare one against the other. 
So it's called the Northeast Snowfall Impact Scale. And it allows us to look at all of the massive snowfall events that have occurred across the Northeast, including Vermont, over time. And the one that still is the, the highest ranking one is the March of 1993 blizzard. But if you look closely, and I'm not sure how, how well you can see this here, but you, you have it on your, um, your, your handout, the number four is actually from two years ago. So um, December of 2022 was the, the fourth highest ranking snowfall that occurred. And you're probably like, oh, how is, how is global warming and these excessive snowfalls taking place at the same time? And it's because we were understanding the, the, the water cycle and how it's accelerating and how you can get both heavy rainfall and, and heavy snowfall as our climate changes in here. So here's a zoom in of that event. And we're looking at, again, December of 2022. And across, um, our, across Vermont, you're seeing that uh, most of the state actually got anywhere between 10 and 20 inches of, of rainfall over that you know, entire time frame. So um, making sure we're, we're looking at, at how these changes occur and where that vulnerability actually kind of plays out. So if you have a lot of snowfall still falling, it is going to melt at some point. And so as you look at how it's melting, what we know is that that snow melt period is actually occurring earlier and earlier. So this is a diagram that comes out of the National Climate Assessment, the fourth National Climate Assessment. It was my privilege to be the lead author on that chapter. And so one of the things that we're seeing is that snow melt occurring earlier and earlier and what that means across the state itself. So that's on the, the, the wet side, that's on, on the, the extreme moisture side. At the same time, we are also seeing drought conditions. And so as you, as you look at this diagram here, is everybody seeing um, these orange and browns and yellows on this part of the diagram, and then teals and, and greens on the lower part of the diagram? Um, the, the, the browns and the yellows and, and the, the oranges show you when you were in drought, and the, the blues and the teals and the greens show you when you were in very good conditions. It starts off in 1895 and it goes down to the present. So what, what we're seeing is that we, <clears throat> we used to have more and very, very extreme, that's what these browns are, very, very extreme droughts. And they're still there, but they are not as um, long and they're not as extensive as before because what happened is we've shifted to wetter conditions. So if I were giving this presentation 50, 60 years ago, we'd be talking more about droughts than we would be talking about floods. So that's one thing to kind of keep in mind that floods and droughts are part of that um, dynamic of, of, of our state. And this diagram here shows us that um, floods and droughts characteristic of the state. So they're all the same except for different years. So the, the upper blue line here shows you the highest that Lake Champlain has ever been. The lowest green line shows you the lowest that Lake Champlain has ever been. So in other words, the driest the lake or the lowest level, the blue line is at the highest flood stage. And the red line in here shows you the median or the middle value, which leaves only one line, which is this purple line here, which is the year itself. So here's 1909, which was a, a dry year with some moisture in here. 1927 was also a dry year. And then we got 200% of rainfall in two days. And we had 1927 floods. So we went mm -hmm. from pretty much drought to floods in two days. The 60s were a drought decade, they were dry decades. So you see it's, it's um, tending low. And then let me move this out of the way here. This is uh, 2011. So Irene here. So Irene set some records here that we didn't see before. The May floods also set some records that we didn't see before. Okay, so 2011, we had two sets of, of records being set mm -hmm. due to the May floods and all that snow melt that occurred. And then Irene came along. So what about 
um, last year as a whole. So this is 2023. And last year as a whole, you're looking at it and you're seeing the droughts that were affecting our farmers in June and into July before that tremendous amount of precipitation that set two new records. So this is the first wave that came down the Winooski and into Lake Champlain as a result of the 10th and the 11th flooding. And then the waters receded a little bit and then we had more precipitation in early August. We set a new set of floods. And then if you look really, really closely, we set some floods last week. You see that? So now we now we have a third set of records for 2023. Okay, so we're looking at all of these levels across in here. All right, so because the state goes from droughts to floods, and we're looking at which sectors are primarily affected by, by drought conditions, for example, um, I went back to October of 2022, and these yellow lines here and the orange lines in here are showing you the extent of the drought two years ago, 2022, across the state itself. And what it shows you are, you know, when these conditions occur, crops are stunted, uh, we have fire danger being elevated, your lawns start out to brown a little bit earlier, your gardens start to wilt. And those are some of the things that we observe when we have a drought. So this was um, two years ago across in here. The other thing that I wanted to kind of highlight is drought is very, very localized. And so if you look at Orange County in here, it, it, it's possible, because again, this is from October of 2022, it's possible for one part of the state to be, one part of the county to be in drought. That's what these browns are, right? It's possible for one part of the county to be in drought and another part of the county to be moist. Why? It goes back to our topography. It goes back to our mountains and valleys and so forth. So all of this, um, is always connected across in here. So drought, wildfires across the state, within the state go together. And whenever we have a drought, um, we're always looking to see how dry it is, whether the winds are picking up, are we gonna have uh, wildfires across the state itself? Not just the wildfires coming down from the southern part of Quebec, but wildfires within the state itself, why? because we've got two times of the year when wildfires are particularly um, prone, springtime and during the summer. So again, we're looking to see the connections across temperature, moisture, wildfires, um, forest burning, and, and all of the conditions that sort of go along with that. The last thing that we need to look at drought for is from an economic perspective because droughts when they, they affect our sugar maples, it affects um, the health and the productivity of our sugar maples. And so it's a, this is another piece as to why we need to, to look at drought and sort of factor that in from a socioeconomic um, damage perspective. So all of that was sort of wrapped up into a lot of the, the thinking that went into um, the writing of the um, Vermont Climate Action Plan, which of course came out of Act 153, the Global Warming Solutions Act. And um, that was of course um, enacted, adopted on the 1st of December, 2021. And we've got just the link across in here um, if you'd like to take another look back through the plan itself. So in looking at the plan in looking at all of the committees that were stood up um, as part of, of this, um, this particular uh, council, the Vermont Climate Council. We had five subcommittees, and one of them was called the Just Transition Subcommittee. <clears throat> um, some wonderful work that came out of, of this subcommittee, and it was my, again, privilege to share some of this with the National Climate Assessment as we were writing up a lot of the, 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 the water chapter part of this, sharing a lot of the, the sort of um, rich resources that came out of, of the council um, into that particular realm in here. So as the, the house appointed member with climate change, climate expertise to the council, um, I was able to, to spearhead the writing of the climate change in Vermont section. Um, so um, again, if, if you haven't had a chance to go through and take a look at it, a lot of the things that I'm presenting today are 
actually part of the, the council report in here. And um, bringing together all of the, the various perspectives in, and ways of knowing. And so Judy Dow was um, an Abenaki elder and scholar who was part of our um, agriculture and ecosystem mm -hmm. subcommittee. And she created this diagram here to help us understand the Abenaki ways of knowing of, of the land and the, the re relationship with the land. And so it was my great privilege to include Judy's diagram as part of that chapter that we're looking at in terms of climate change in Vermont. Um, the other thing that I did was to bring all of the, the discussions and the subcommittees and the task groups, all of our discussions into this diagram here, which centers all of the, the elements of what we're looking at in terms of climate change in the state. So you see the air quality, we see our growing seasons, we see our hazards, but centering it in an equity frame centering it in all ways of knowing, centering it in with the, the, the various challenges. So whether they are land use challenges, whether they are um, governance challenges, whether there are regions of Vermont that should or should not be developed, whether our um, infrastructure is able to support a lot of the priorities and solutions that we came up with and making sure that all of this um, continues to evolve with the best science possible so that we can plan for the future in the best way possible. So this diagram, this do no harms diagram, I actually shared with the White House um, a couple of months ago um, as part of the um, framework for thinking about creating um, resilience planning across the nation itself. So in, in looking at one last diagram from that section, um, this is where we're putting all of those risks to hazards in one place and looking to see um, whether they are going to increase in frequency or intensity or duration or whether they are likely to decrease and how confident we are in those changes. So you're looking at all of the things that we've talked about so far, your droughts, your floods, your ice storms, heavy precipitation, snowfall, cold conditions, and so on. These are all part of, of, of that write-up of, of climate change in Vermont in the Climate Action Plan. So this plan, which was adopted, is actually featured in the fifth National Climate Assessment, which um, was released on the 14th of November, 2023. And in the Northeast chapter, it, it's wonderful to see it being pulled out here. So Vermont releases the state's first climate action plan because what, what the, the Northeast chapter is looking at is what is the progress that it is being made in the adaptation, in the resilience, in the mitigation space. And so our, our climate action plan was pulled up, which is, is very, very nice to see in here. And so all of these things that we're looking at, all of the, the, the statistics, the summary values and so on um, can be found in the, the state climate summary for Vermont. And again, um, on your hard copy, you've got a, a, the link directly to that itself. So let's head into the sort of solution space, the sort of what can we do about this? And we're gonna look at this from two perspectives. We're gonna look at it from a people-based perspective and also gonna look at it from a land-based perspective. So for us to, to, to really start to make progress in this, um, a lot of it depends on having everybody at the table from the beginning so that we can share our experiences, our knowledge, our ways of knowing, our expertise all from the beginning. Um, this has to be a people-centered approach. So we're, we're, we're looking at um, peoples, we're looking at health, we're looking at everything um, from us as, as, a, as a society, we're looking at cultures, we're looking at linguistic pieces in here as we try to figure out what's the best way of, of trying to make sure that we are, uh, are not leaving anybody behind. Second way that we're gonna look at this is from a land-based perspective. And as, as we look at it, our working lands, our natural lands, our forested lands, our agricultural lands, how are they helping us both from a, an adaptation space, how are they helping us from a resilience space, how are they helping us from a mitigation space? And agriculture is a great example of being both um, mitigation as well as adaptation. And um, why are we sort of pulling the land-based piece out in particular? it's because our seasons are changing. And our seasons, as they change, 
are going to see differences and changes in our forests, in our wildlife, the snowpack, changes in our growing seasons, changes in when droughts occur. And so that focus on land, the working and natural land is, is one thing that we're sort of putting forward in this particular space here. The other thing that we're looking at is um, making sure that we elevate um, nature-based solutions, that we preserve parts of our landscape that we know help with um, ecosystem, ecosystem services, um, and also looking at ways in which, from a water-based perspective, that we're trying to slow down moving water, um, allow floodplains <laughs> to, to have access to, to the, the sort of meandering that would usually occur. And so um, these are a couple of slides from Mike Klein, who was um, the, the, the head of the Rivers Program, and, and looking at what happens when we try to um, allow floodplains to be floodplains so that we have less damage from an infrastructure perspective, but also less damage from an ecosystem perspective in here. And so um, a lot of this work that, that Mike um, shared with me to help share with you today um, came out of, of Act 138 in looking at the protection of our river corridors in here. So I'm gonna end with a couple of um, recommendations, suggestions, requests, and one of them is to um, sort of lift up the, the, the priorities that were listed in the, the Climate Action Plan. Um, a lot of them are being implemented right now. Um, and if there are others that could be sort of lifted up and elevated, that would be one thing in here. Um, a lot of progress being made on two elements of the Climate Action Plan. One is a municipal climate toolkit, which brings together all of the resources that are available, that could be used on a municipal or town level, and that could be available through our regional planning commissions. And related to that is, is coming up with a, a vulnerability index to see who, what, where, and when uh, are most vulnerable, and, and how does that allow us to make decisions from a resource allocation perspective and from other perspectives um, across in here. And then there are so many wonderful um, projects and, and priorities being implemented across all of the various agencies in the state of Vermont, all the various commissions, um, all the various regional planning commissions. And so how do we support and make sure they're all interfacing and, and leveraging each other yes. moving forward? And then if, if I had to leave um, one word or one phrase in here, it would be to, to make sure that we're doing this from an all hazards perspective, from a systems perspective, so that as things tend to flip as they do across the state, we're making sure that we have uh, the resources allocated across in here. And then um, the last thing I, I'd sort of put forward is <clears throat> lessons learned from 2023, frost, drought, floods. How about having a statewide summit that brings together all of the agencies that were involved, both the state of Vermont agencies, the federal agencies, like National Weather Service, the National Resource Conservation <laughs> um, Service, we've got uh, the US Geological Survey, um, all of the agencies that were involved in helping us to respond to these various hazards. Let's see what lessons we've learned um, <laughs> so that we can then create a, a plan that moves forward in, in this particular space in here. And so, um, one way of doing that is, is I'm, I'm going to suggest um, having a, a hazard coordinator that um, sits in the office of the Vermont State Climatologist that works directly with towns and municipalities. Um, this is what I did with one of my classes two years ago when we worked directly with the town of Underhill to assist in lifting up um, climate change in their local hazard mitigation plan. And Having students directly involved is a, is a great way to support um, this particular type of activity. And they can also serve as, as, as liaisons to the legislature and sort of support a lot of the, the exchange of information and knowledge. Um, another piece in here is we, we don't have enough measurements of how much rainfall, how much snowfall is actually falling across the state. And so I am um, one of the co coordinators of the what's called the COCORAS program that measures um, uh, precipitation in, in everybody's like backyard. And so it would be great if, if we could buy a rain gauge for more Vermonters to be able to measure how much is, is falling 
and so we can do a better um, better job with our forecast, a better job with ground truthing, all of this that's taking place. And then the last thing is, how do we take those lessons learned and get it out to everybody across the state of Vermont? And so um, I was approached by a group in the United Kingdom called Research Futures, and what they are willing to do is to bring all of these lessons learned, maybe from the summit that I'm proposing here, bring it all together and package it into podcasts, into various elements of social media, into to maps, into um, ways of getting that information out so everybody can access it and, and be able to understand that all of these hazards um, occur everywhere. All of these hazards we need to know about. And it's not just um, hurricanes that give us flooding, for example. How do we make sure all of those words and understanding get out there? So with that, um, I thank you again for the invitation to provide this um, information and testimony, and I'll turn it back over to our chair, Sheldon. Thank you so much for that um, information-packed lecture. <laughs> um, do members have questions? I do have. Thank you. Thank you, doctor. Uh, Going back a ways in some of the maps that you had, you indicated Lyme disease has come further north, but Massachusetts had no no color in, in the entire state. Do you know why? It's probably because of how the data are being reported. So each state, the, the Department of Health, each state collects the data and then sends that up to the Centers for Disease Control. And if if the data are not reported, then the Centers for Disease Control, CDC, don't have that information to put on the map itself. So I'm not sure um, what would happen in Massachusetts, but I would suspect that, that the information exists and that there are um, massive Lyme disease um, cases across that state as well. That's what I would have thought. Thank you. Um, My pleasure. Actually, I have a question. I, I have a question. I'm curious about the, the sort of um, ability of the climate to recover in the instance that we potentially significantly reduce the amount of CO2 we were emitting um, and perhaps change some of our land use practices. Who's working on models that would help us understand the ability of natural systems to recover? So I would say a lot of that is um, part of the National Climate Assessment because what the, the NCA, as it's called, is, is designed to do is to do two things. Look backwards to see what progress we've made, but also to project out to the future to see um, what are some of the, the, the scenarios, what are some of the storylines that could occur if we reduce um, greenhouse gas emissions by certain amounts, right? The, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change is also doing the same thing. And mm -hmm. one of the things that's important to, to understand is even if we stopped every single greenhouse gas emission into the atmosphere today, the climate would still continue to warm because of all of the gases that are already there. Mm -hmm. it, it's something called inertia. It, it's like when you step on the brakes, you don't stop immediately. You, you go forward a little bit and then you stop that's what's taking place in the atmosphere right now. So even if every single greenhouse gas were never ever to be emitted, starting right today, the 3rd of January, 2024, you'd still see the atmosphere warm a little bit because it has all those gases already in the atmosphere right now. And they're still doing what they do. So they're still absorbing radiation and giving it back out, causing the air to be warmer than it would be if they weren't there. So part of what, um, the, the scientists who do a lot of the modeling are looking at is if, if we stop the gases, how much more would it increase by? If we are aggressive, how much that would it, it stop it by? If we're not aggressive, how much would that stop it by? So they're coming up with all of these um, ranges of what could occur. And that's where you hear things like trying to limit the warming to 1.5 degrees or two degrees, that's where they're getting those values from. Thank you. Um, who, did someone over? I thought I saw Representative Pouch or Representative Burke. Okay, I thought I saw a hand. Right. 
Thank you so much for your presentation. It was very edifying. I, I hope it wasn't too much. No, but I, there's, I, there's, a lot, there's a lot of information to un I, unpack yeah. here. I, I will say, as the facilitator, I looked down at 58 slides. I don't know how this is going to happen, but you did it. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Well, some, of, some, some of them are intro slides, but thank you again. For the, uh, Great. Uh, okay, I guess we're you. seeing a, one question. Representative yeah. Burke. I have a question. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor. Um, how, how do you do you feel hopeful or I mean you're working with this all the time do you feel I mean given that Vermont is not really we're not even reaching our own climate goals which is distressing uh, what what's your what are your thoughts or let me ask you so people always ask me that question they say do you ever get depressed? How do you get out of bed in the morning? <laughs> and I, <laughs> yeah, I know. So I, I have a couple answers to that. The, the first <clears throat> one is um, every single day, we learn a little bit more about our climate that we didn't know before. And that helps us to, it's like a jigsaw puzzle. It helps us to have one more piece of, of data or information or understanding if we didn't have that would allow us to make a slightly different um, choice or maybe tweak something that we're already doing. So that's one piece in the puzzle. We're always learning, we're always improving, the models are getting better and we're having a, a better sense of, of what we need to do. The other thing that gives me hope, that gets me out of bed is our young people because our young people have such a sophisticated grasp of all of the ins and outs of what's taking place on the <clears throat> land, but also what's taking place in the atmosphere. It is amazing to, to watch. And that is what gives, gets me up. When I work with my classes, when I see all of these wonderful young people bringing not just the energy and their passion, the enthusiasm, but their understanding to the table, that's what keeps me going. Thank you. That was a great way to end. Thank you so much for joining us. No problem. No problem. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Take care. And, and with that, members, I think we'll take a five minute break and, and work hard to get back on track. So, a couple minutes past the hour, we will reconvene after our break. So, we'll